I will start with a quotation. War unequivocally changes language, its architecture, the scope of its use. War, like an intruder's shoe, disrupts the ant colony of communication. Afterwards, ants, akin to the speakers of a disjointed language, feverishly attempt to restore its record structure and tidy up what they were used to, what their lives had been. These are the words of Ukrainian poet, prose writer and rock star Serhii Zhadan in his acceptance speech for the Peace Prize of the German book trade in October last year. The topic of my remarks today has a double focus. I will give you some glimpses into the responses of Ukrainian writers to the experience of war, to the violence of war, to the force of resistance. And we will look in particular on how issues related to language are reflected in such responses. The war changes the language, not only within the realm of literature, of course. Ukrainian linguists have already noted and commented on uh, semantic shifts and linguistic innovations, such as the verb shoiguvati, pretend that everything is fine when it isn't, alluding to the name of the Russian Minister of Defense, or bavovna, the Ukrainian word for cotton, meaning explosion on Russian territory, alluding through wordplay to the Russian euphemistic manner of referring to such explosion, explosions as bangs rather than explosions. Bang in Russian, chlopok, uh, differing only in stress and pronunciation from chlopok, which means cotton. Also, sociolinguists and soci sociologists study developments within the socio-cultural linguistic sphere, including a remarkable shift from Russian to Ukrainian among Ukrainians who grew up in a Russian-speaking family or environment. But moving to the sphere of literature, uh, there are projects such as writer and critic Ostap Slivinsky's Dictionary of War, consisting of short texts gathered from victim, vi victims and witnesses, each text, text highlighting one particular, particular signal word or thing. He calls it pure documentary, nothing imagined, nothing fictionalized. But there came a moment, he continues, when I understood that this is also poetry. This insight probably arose from the briefness and clarity of these short texts, as you can see from some examples, as well as, on, as, well as from the focus on particular words, on language, and how the meaning of these words changes with the radically changed condition of war. Asked about the language issue in an interview, Slavinsky characterizes Ukrainian as, I quote, a safe space, a way to separate yourself from danger, to separate yourself from the aggressive, dangerous, alien. A quite remarkable thing to say in view of the long history of linguistic and political repression of all things Ukrainian during the, time, the times of Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. This awareness that the Russian aggression is also seeking to destroy Ukrainian culture, language and identity, something that has, as I just mentioned, uh, a long history in Ukraine, is also echoed in many texts. Anastasia Afanasyeva, a Ukrainian poet from, from Kharkiv, who wrote and published in Russian until the start of the full-scale invasion, tackles the question of language and identity in a very concrete way. Her poem, entitled A New Song of Silence, starts off in Russian and switches to Ukrainian in the latter half of the text. And don't despair, you're not supposed to read this, but just look at it and you can see how it, how it makes the shift from Russian to Ukrainian. Afanasyeva now writes in, in Ukrainian. 
And the shift, ref shift reflects a quite common trend in post-2014 Ukraine, where many Russian-speaking Ukrainians have switched to Ukrainian, or people who re regularly use both languages give priority to Ukrainian. And we looked at, at some of these statistics above. As Afanasyeva's poem shows an, us in a remarkably radical way, this is a switch that also many writers have made. My second example also highlights the parallel between the war as such and the attack against language and culture. The poem, poem is by poet, translator and artist Lesik Panasiuk. And I will read this one to you in English translation. The letters go to war. They combine into words that no one wants to utter. Sentences explode on landmines. Stories are shelled by multiple rocket launches. A shell hits the, war, the word dim, home. Through the broken window of the letter D, you can see how the letter E loses its head, how the roof of the letter M collapses. In times of war, the language can't be understood. The sentences are so clumsy. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to speak. Next to the hospital bed of the letter Y lies a prosthesis of the diacritic sign she is ashamed of. The gaps of the stitches open up again in the letter F. From bullet wounds on the etymological front, the soft sign has lost its tongue during torture. The ward is filled with letters, to the point that there's no room for a single apostrophe. Paint drops off the walls. Words fall off in incomprehensible twists and turns. And who will speak them? The poem becomes an allegory of war by describing the letters as human beings. We can also note the mix of military terms and linguistic terms. These war biographies of the individual letters point, on a more general level, at the vulnerability of language and by implication to the struggle, risk, and in the end, impossibility of language in conveying the experience of war, in expressing the inexpressible. I've discussed a couple of examples taken from the genre of poetry, and this is no coincidence. While the war that started in 2014 with Russia's annexation of Crimea and subsequent involvement in Donbass has inspired a wide array of literature, ranging from documentary genres to novels. And I'm just showing some of, of, of the books uh, that have appeared in translation here. The response to the full-scale invasion has so far mainly been within the genres of documentary prose and poetry. Novels may need more time. Besides, to many writers, the reality of war has led to a pause in their creative literary work. Art has been put on hold. Many writers have joined the armed forces of Ukraine. Many writers are engaged in voluntary work, both for the soldiers and for civil society. War is a time for action, not writing, many writers said. In the words of Victoria Amelina, one of Ukraine's most talented young writers, and I'm grateful to Alessia for bringing her in earlier today. I quote, Writing fiction feels pointless now. There's no need to invent anything when reality surpasses literature in intensity. Words have taken on new meanings. That's why the few poems I've written since the beginning of the invasion don't contain any metaphors, pretentiousness, or attempt to impress. There is straightforwardness, plain meanings, snippets of information. I call it obvious things that were written down in a column during the war. Let me show you one of Amelina's famous wartime poems, which also reflect on the issue of language and poetry writing in times of war. It's entitled, No Poetry. I don't write poetry, I'm a prose writer. It's just that the reality of war destroys punctuation, 
plot coherence, destroys coherence as if language was hit by a shell. The debris of language may look like poetry, but it is not. This is no poetry either. Poetry is in Kharkiv, volunteering. Amelina's poem, because it is one, even if it claims not to be, expresses with full force both the inexpressibility of war experience and the necessity of trying, nevertheless, to put this very experience into words. It is important that we discuss, read, translate and make known Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian arts, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian history, not only because it is Ukrainian, but because it represents a culture of extraordinary quality and diversity. But in the middle of an ongoing genocidal war, it is not enough for a literary scholar or linguist to study and work with texts and tell others about them, as I do now. In order to understand, or at least try to understand, the conditions of Ukrainian culture, both historically and now, we need to bring the people creating this literature this art, to bring them in and to talk about their lives, their commitments and their fates. And we shall therefore return in some detail to the tragic fate of Victoria Amelina in a moment. And Alessia and I decided over lunch that her story can be told and should be told twice during such a symposium on war and peace. Meanwhile, as the war dragged on, to many writers, the necessity of art, of literature, came back with new force. Serhii Jadan, whom I quoted in the beginning, and who has been deeply involved in voluntary work since 2014, recently published a new collection of poetry. Interestingly, the title of the collection is Skripnipivka, which is the name of the Kharkiv orthography of 1928, later superseded by the Soviet Ukrainian orthography of 1933 with strong Russifying elements. Jadan describes precisely the process that I've been talking about. I quote, a few months after the beginning of the Great War, and that's the Ukrainian term for the full-scale invasion, um, the language began to return. This book is a collection of poems about language, about its ability to return and reproduce itself, about its vulnerability, about its capacity for resistance. In fact, we can see that many war poems seek to convey this very dilemma, the abyss between art and the reality of war, combining it with the insight that, after all, Perhaps only art is capable of conveying this reality in a meaningful way. In some of the saddest stories from this war, the literary work of a writer and the reality of war are intertwined in ways that themselves defy words. Victoria Emelina turned not only from prose to poetry after the full-scale invasion, she joined the Truth Hounds, a human rights organization engaged in documenting war crimes. She was the one who found the diary of Volodymyr Vakulenko, a well-known Ukrainian author of children's stories, in his native village of Kapitolivka on the 24th of September 2022, two weeks after Ukrainian forces had liberated the Kharkiv area. Vakulenko had buried the journal in the garden the day before he was abducted by the Russians on March 24, 2022. He was tortured, murdered and buried in a mass grave. His case is still being investigated by the truth hounds and Ukrainian law enforcement agencies. It seems that he was turned in just because he believed in the idea of Ukraine, spoke Ukrainian, had Ukrainian books and some patriotic tattoos. The diary or notebook was later published with a foreword by Amelina. <laughs> 
Amelina trained to become a war crime investigator and collected do documentation and witness stories at many sites of war crimes. She was also working on a non-fiction book in English entitled Looking at Women, Looking at War. On the 27th of June this year, she was in Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine, accompanying a small delegation of Colombian writers who had participated, like Amelina, in a big book festival in Kiev the previous days. And you can see a poster from this book festival with a very powerful sim symbolic um, depiction of what culture as resistance can also be can also mean. <clears throat> a Russian missile hit the pizza restaurant where they were having dinner that night. 13 people were killed. And Victoria Melina was critically injured and died on the 1st of July. Among her many initiatives to promote Ukrainian literature and culture was the U New York Literature Festival that also Olesya mentioned. So, New York, New York is a small town in the Donetsk Oblast. Um, Alicia also showed us this tweet, but I will read it in full. Uh, and uh, this was tweeted by Melena after Russian forces bombed the festival site. She wrote on Twitter, When I found that the New York Literature Festival in a small village called New York in the Donbass I was, of course, being ironic. After all, irony is what makes literature great. Self-irony made the village of New York a fantastic place. Russians have no self-irony. They are so serious about themselves. I bet they ruin our self-ironic, beautiful New York with their serious Russian faces. But the Ukrainians will survive, laugh, and make literature festivals, not war, in all possible New Yorks. I promise. In these formulations, we sense that Amelina hints at what makes poetry and literature, art in general, capable of expressing something else, something unique, something other. Irony and a positive vision of the future are just one or two possible aspects of this capability. Returning to the fundamental dilemma of giving voice to that which in essence, cannot be expressed, such as the experience of war. This is actually something that many poems address, also on a meta level. It is, in a sense, an additional dimension of the perceived abyss between art and the reality of war. Let me show you one example, a poem by Irina Shuvalova, entitled The Unsayable. Look, look, look here. Here it lies, the unsayable, heavy as the dead body of a loved one, long as the night when they are bound to be shelling. Take the unsayable under its armpits wet from blood, drag it, leave traces, let them be visible in the morning from afar. Words here combine into images that again combine to give expression to something called the unsayable. In this process, embodiment plays an important role, as does the active involvement of the reader or poem's addressee, as we can see from the abundance of imperatives and apostrophes. We can note that the very dilemma of expressing the inexpressible is, as it were, the poem's overall topic, it's in the title. Uh, the result, however, it is more than a metapoetic statement. The unspeakable has quite literally been given embodiment and poetic visibility in this short poem that in this way conveys to the reader at least some fragmentary glimpse into what it means to experience war. An important point here is the question of, or position of, of the reader. When I said fragmentary glimpse, I might be thinking of a reader that has not experienced war in the way Ukrainians inside Ukraine have to a lesser or greater degree. 
This point is emphasized in a slightly different context in Alyssa Werker of Stanford University's recent study of war poetry reimagined by users of TikTok. Werker studies how, um, how users remake war poems by Serhii Jadan, whom I quoted in the beginning, in videos where they use their own footage, that is, the voice of Jadan's recording, uh, reading, uh, reading his poems, accompanies images, photographs, or other user-generated material. She makes the point that Jadan's poetry, in fact, gives voice, gives, gives words, gives language to many people who would otherwise not have this language to express themselves and their experience of war. I would like to add that this phenomenon, which arises thanks to the remediation of Jadan's poetry, reflects and reinforces a quality of Jadan's writing as a whole, as he often conveys the voice and perspective of outsiders, of marginalized people. As we can see from this last example, there are many, many different contexts and aspects linked to the question of war poetry and more broadly to literature and the use of language and its role during the war. And I've touched only upon a few of them here. As I discussed above, many writers said, in particular in the first months of the full-scale invasion, that war is a time for action, not writing. But in the words of Victoria Amelina, I quote, As a human rights activist, I document war crimes and advocate for justice. Yet, as a writer, I know that there are wounds only stories can heal. Still, there will always be experiences that will be silenced forever. This point is made by a Ukrainian philosopher and journalist Volodymyr Yermolenko in an essay entitled Beyond Silence. There, was all, there will always be experiences that would not be told, partly because there is no one left to talk about the most atrocious things. Still, even Yermolenko's essay ends on a belief in the ability of language to survive and help survive. So I will close with a quotation, as I started with a quotation, because I think it's appropriate to bring in Ukrainian voices. Yes, we are reclaiming only small islands of language from the dark and terrifying ocean of muteness. Yes, we will never bring that sunken ship to the surface. Yes, we will never, return, never turn these islands into a large and well-fed landmass, but we can live on them. If you have the words, you can stand firm for now. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>